So my name oh, must be back. <laughs> so my name is Eric Lindsay. I'm the director of student recruitment. I'm here at Shepherd's College. We're located up in Union Grove, Wisconsin, and so we're a three-year post-secondary ed program for students with IDD. Liz. Oh, yeah. So welcome everybody. My name is Elizabeth Potter. I'm the Outreach Development Specialist at Pace at National Lewis University. Uh, we're located downtown Chicago. And so we're super excited to be able to have you here and really start the conversation of what does it look like to prepare students for a post-secondary uh, program like ours. So we're excited that you could join us. Thank you. Now, uh, we have a chat feature available to you guys. If you want to speak, since it's a, it's a smaller group, we kind of expected that. We can go with questions that way. If you want to just chat them, if you don't feel like talking, that's fine too. Um, we're, we're happy to, to end. Um, oh, Andrew was there and then he's, he's back. <laughs> Welcome back, Andrew. We'll let Sorry Andrew about that. As soon as I hit uh, everybody join, my computer crashed. And so uh, <laughs> But I am so glad that uh, you all are uh, here and able to uh, meet with us and, and hear what we have to say about getting students ready for post-secondary uh, programs. And so uh, hopefully we went through some uh, introductions right off the bat, but I just wanted to, to let you know, my name is Drew Burles. I'm the assistant director for the RISE program over at Judson University. Um, and we're a two-year program that is geared toward uh, independent living skills and vocational skills all within the realm of our Christian institution of Judson University. And so uh, we're a two-year certificate program where our students live on campus. Uh, they have a college experience while they're learning those independent living skills. Uh, and that's just a little bit about what our program is. If you want more information, you can surely contact me directly. Uh, but as we talk about some different things today, uh, I'll be the one that's kind of monitoring um, our chat and uh, kind of leading the conversation with some of the questions that were already submitted. And so we'll go ahead and just go around and have um, the other programs here introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about their program before we get into uh, some of the questions that uh, we have. If you have any questions that we aren't answering um, or you have one that comes to mind as we're talking, go ahead and put that in the chat. Uh, you can feel free. We are a small group. So if you do have a question, you can unmute yourself and, and ask it verbally as well. Um, but uh, if you'd rather just put it in the chat, feel free to do that and I'll go ahead and, and be monitoring that conversation. Um, we can go ahead, I'll, uh, Tim, you're the first one on my screen, so I'll go ahead and have you uh, start us off with some introductions. So uh, if you aren't familiar with ELSA, we're the four-year college experience program at Elmhurst College. And by the way, for those of you, uh, Jill, I see you in there, um, local tomorrow, we're gonna become Elmhurst University. So this is the last day. I'm gonna, well, actually, this doesn't say college on it. So I get to keep this t-shirt. But tomorrow I get to bring out the university t-shirt. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. The new gates are going to be unveiled tomorrow and stuff like that if you live in Elmhurst like Jill does. Um, so that's kind of exciting. Uh, that's not really going to affect our program too much in terms of how we do it. Um, we are still kind of focused on a four-year college experience, um, being integrated into the college environment, living on campus um, with the ultimate goal of becoming employed and better able to live independent at the end. Some unique features with us, if you haven't heard, is we do have the ELSA Plus track where our students can take college classes to sort of augment the program. They can do it not for credit, and have that augmentation affect their career goals with ELSA, or potentially could take those classes for credit and maybe have the possibility of working towards a degree program. And then I do have a, a program we call the Advantage Program, where I have degree-seeking students at Elmhurst who need a little bit more support than what's typically available, and will take one class with ELSA while they're pursuing their degree program, one per semester until they're kind of comfortable. So we kind of meet our students in different places at the campus, uh, and we have students who live on campus and students who commute. Um, that's sort of the general idea of the program. I think most of you have seen me speak or heard about this before, but um, if you want to get more in depth about the program, obviously this is not our admissions presentation. Um, we're going to get kind of get into the admission requirements and such, but I'll save that for the discussion. Uh, Elizabeth. Oh uh, yeah, thank you. I feel like you gave me the baton. So I <laughs> introduced myself again. I'm Elizabeth Potter. I am the Outreach Development Specialist at Pace at National Lewis University. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're 
what you'll discover about all of our programs is that there's many things that we have similar and certainly the college experience and the importance of that you know, you'll see different elements that contribute to that what I can say, uh, maybe highlight some of the things that are different is we're a three year college experience program. So our students are individuals that would perhaps find it challenging or difficult to be able to navigate traditional college education, whether, whether with additional support or not. So our students are looking to have the skills necessary um, to be able to live independently. And so college, um, a college degree is not a part of that program. Once our students complete our program, so again, it's a three-year certificate program, and once they complete with over a thousand hours of employment experience, they do have the ability to continue on with us. And so we've heard from our families quite often, so once you graduate, what happens next? And so we do offer two additional programs called Pace Ahead as well as Pace Beyond. And so both of these programs are available to students who have graduated from the program. So Pace Ahead students can live with us for two additional years. They're not ready to fly the coop. Uh, oh, sorry, like a storm cloud over my head. There you go. So, um, so they can stay with us for two additional years. So they're living with us. They're able to continue to use all of our services, our job coach, our employment services, our life, uh, life skills instructors, and then pace beyond. And so that's beyond living into life. And so they live on their own and our families are able to utilize all of our services as well on an as need basis. So as they feel the need, whether or not this, they are going up for a job interview or they're going for their annual review and they want a job Job coach with them to assist with that or they want a job coach to go to their um, new hire orientation with them so we're able to assist families inside of our partnership with them not only once they make the decision to be a part of Pace community but really moving forward in life to continue to, their success so we'll talk about more again right this is not a overview of the complete program but just to kind of highlight some of the differences um, that uh, that Pace offers and so now Eric it's your turn. Awesome, thanks. Uh, so yeah, again, my name is Eric. I'm the Director of Student Recruitment here at Shepherds. We are a three-year um, accredited college program, and we're not attached to any larger university um, like the other programs are. We're just our own college right here in Union Grove. And so if you don't know where Union Grove is, if you take 94 up into Wisconsin and get off on Highway 11, we're about 15 minutes west of Racine. Um, so that, that can be helpful. But yeah, we do um, life skills and vocational training. And so um, one of our distinctives is that we have three specific majors that we're training our students in, and it's horticulture, culinary arts, and technology. And then they also do a handful of life skills as they go through the three years with us. And then they live on campus in a dorm, and then a hall, and then an apartment. So it's kind of our residential tiered model that they go through gaining more and more um, independence and responsibility along the way. And then in the evenings, we'll do a bunch of fun stuff out in the community, and we'll also do Special Olympics and clubs and, and other things of that sort as well. And so, yeah, ours is a three-year program, or we're considered a specialized program since we're only serving students with intellectual and developmental disabilities on our campus. So that's the 30-second overview of Shepherds College. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Eric. Um, so... Today, our primary goal with this educator fair is uh, to talk about uh, preparing students for post-secondary opportunities. And so um, all four of us are uh, post-secondary opportunities. We, we did have an additional one um, who was unable to uh, attend today at Bethesda uh, College. And so um, we uh, will be able to, to get some information to, to contact um, her if you have specific information that you want to know about. Uh, Bethesda um, that way. Uh, but for the four of us, we um, want to talk a little bit about um, what it takes to, to get students prepared to come to programs like ours, uh, what we're specifically looking for within our programs, and how we're a little bit different from each other. Uh, as Elizabeth was saying, we all, um, we serve the same populations, students with uh, disabilities, and so uh, we're very similar in our approach that way, but we all have our own nuances and differences. And so we want you as educators to be able to uh, help your students find what the next steps are for them. And so having uh, the, the best information from each of our programs is our goal for today. And so as I was saying, uh, I'm gonna be going through some questions that were already submitted. Uh, if you have any additional questions you'd like us to, to 
cover, you can put them in the chat or we'll have some time where you can uh, unmute yourself and, and talk with us that way. Um, we uh, have scheduled out about um, 90 minutes for our time here. We don't have to fill up that whole time. Uh, we wanna be sensitive of your time um, and make sure that you're able to do everything you need to do as well. So uh, if we don't go that full time, just so you know, we may not uh, be extending that way. As we start our conversation, um, I'd love for us to just kind of talk about uh, what our entrance requirements are uh, for each of our institutions, and then uh, maybe what some of the, the skills do we ex expect students to have when they're coming into our program already. Uh, and so the, let's, uh, let's just start with PACE. So Elizabeth, if you uh, can, can answer some of those questions, what are the entrance requirements for you? Um, and then what do you expect students to uh, come into the program with? What skills do you expect them to come in with? Wonderful, thank you, Drew. So the entrance requirements uh, uh, for uh, to apply for PACE at National Lewis University is being between the ages of 18 and 28. So 28 is certainly on the older range of our students and typically at, by the time they're 28, they're completing the program. So somebody older than that, um, since we're residential based, we may not be the best fit. So between that age group, we're also looking for our students to either have completed high school or have a certificate of completion. And so a high school diploma is not required to um, submit your application at PACE. There's additional um, admissions documents that we would be looking at, but really the, the, th the two things we're looking for is really ensuring that the family and the student are both committed to living life independently. So we don't have any additional requirements in terms of minimum grade score or or taking the SAT or ACT or any other entrance exams, what we're really looking for is a family, a student that's motivated to live independently. So the, that would be our, our baseline because everything else will show up inside of the interview process to ensure that um, what they're looking for uh, in a post-secondary program is what we're able to provide and support. Um, so that's the, those are the main things. Uh, in terms of what students, what we're looking for for students as they are through the admissions, pro as they're going through the admissions process, uh, we, do, we are in downtown Chicago uh, and we are not a therapeutic program. So it, we're really looking for a level of maturity in terms of self-management. And so um, on some level in terms of emotional regulation, so what, 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 ways do they manage stress to ensure that it is something that would work with inside of our residential environment. Um, the other piece is really um, uh, being able to communicate in a way, in whatever way that is, to be able to communicate what they're experiencing. So we do have two licensed counselors on staff as well as um, student advisors where they can talk to to be able to process. But really what we're looking for is individuals that can communicate what they need and they have the emotional uh, regulation ability to be able to manage um, their stress levels. Everything else we're gonna be able to provide them in the program. Great, thank you. Uh, let's let's move on to Tim. Why don't you go ahead and answer that that same question? What are some of the admission requirements, and what skills do you uh, expect students to come in with? Very similar to what you saw at Pace. We're eighteen to twenty-eight. Um, we're always concerned with reading levels. Um, reading and comprehension is pretty important to us, so we generally look for somebody who's reading and doing math and comprehending um, at a, about the third grade as, as a minimum. Um, probably an average my students are reading and doing math and whatnot between six and six and eighth grade on average across the program with a lot of variation on that um, and then we're always looking for that sort of emotional independence um, to be able to navigate a campus and those kinds of things I think it's going to be across the board in here that we're also not a therapeutic program um, so they, they need to have independence to be able to kind of navigate getting the classes and those kinds of things we provide supports our students who live on campus have life coaches um, so there's definitely some nets in place but we're really working towards seeing our students have the independence to kind of get around now our campus is all centrally located in elmhurst in one kind of main area um, so you know it's kind of getting comfortable with the campus and getting around those kinds of things um, but when we have sort of extremes and depression or extremes and those kinds of things, we're not quite as equipped because we don't have 24 seven 
you know, adult supervision in the residence halls and so forth. Um, we do have our own specialized trained students who live on the floor with our students, but they are part of our general population. And the only other kind of weird caveat that, that's unique to us, I think, is for our students who live on campus, um, we ask that they are their own personal guardian. Um, so they can have a plain area of partial guardianship and parents can hang, hang on to financial or health guardianship, but our students who live on campus need to be able to make their own yes and no decisions and um, you know, adhere to the rules of the road as it were. So we usually ask for, for at least a partial personal guardianship for our students. Um, and in terms of the admission process, um, a lot of you probably been through it with us. We, we do have a couple of re letter recommendation forms. We usually ask the families to, to have you fill out teachers or counselors to fill out kind of a ratings form to kind of get your take on there. Um, and then we ask for the IEP and the most recent psychological evaluation as part of that for our admissions paperwork. We kind of look at all that stuff and then bring the family in for an admission interview. And then if they want to live on campus, we have a second housing screening where they meet with our, our psychologist and our housing coordinator in the program. We kind of go over a lot of that sort of as it would be related to guardianship. And a lot like what Elizabeth said, we're, we're kind of looking for that, that somewhat maturity, independence, ability, which is why we're a fan of transition. We don't require our students to go through transition to get into the program. We take students directly out of high school, but it, it, it overall, in the in time, we'll, we'll look at a, an evaluation or meet with a family and kind of like, you should probably do some more transition and we'll recommend that sometimes. Um, so we're, you know, it doesn't mean they have to complete transition and be in it until they're 22, but we see more success with those students who have, generally speaking, lots of exceptions because, you know, all of our students are unique flowers. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Uh, <clears throat> one, one thing I wanted to point out is that Tim, as opposed to the other programs here, uh, Elsa has both a, um, commuter program as well as a residential program. Is that correct, Tim? Yeah, that's right. It's not required to live on campus. So if the guardianship is an issue or the student, you feel like the student can handle the academics but not the living piece, that could be made available later. You know, we can ease in part-time. You know, we, we were pretty flexible with that. And I should have mentioned, somebody asked about uh, the students need to be independent with medication management. Um, at our program, yes, they do. We, we don't provide medication at, at ELSA. Yeah. And that I'll, uh, I'll speak on this question and I'll hand it over to Eric to, to speak a little bit as well. Um, for us over at RISE, we uh, are similar to, to uh, Elsa and Pace. We have an 18 to 25 age range that we go through. Um, we do uh, find it beneficial for a lot of our students to go through transition programs before coming into ours. But again, it's not a requirement. Um, sometimes we'll even recommend that for families who have applied and we may say, we think that your student might need a little extra time in, in their transition program before um, attending ours. That's something that we've done in the past. Uh, our program does uh, require a diagnosed intellectual disability to be a part of ours. Our curriculum is designed specifically for students with intellectual disabilities, uh, targeting that um, kind of IQ range that we have there. And so um, that is a requirement for, for our program as well. Um, we do uh, about third or fourth grade reading writing level. Um, we have students participating in traditional undergraduate courses uh, on our campus. And so in order to um, be able to take some of the information away from that, we, we find that third to fourth grade reading level being uh, a necessity there. Um, and then a, a strong desire to live on a college campus. That's a big part of our program is to, uh, to want that college experience. And so um, that is one of our uh, kind of requirements within, within us. And we get through that with parent interviews and student interviews and different things like that throughout the admission process. Um, in terms of skills that we ask students to come in with, basic um, technology skills. All of our students need to have a cell phone um, for us to, to do some of our safety protocols. We have um, a Life360 app that we use with our students to make sure that um, we know that they're staying safe. Um, Basic uh, computer skills is, is helpful in that as well. Um, they're not required to, to have a computer. We give all of our students an iPad when they come into our program. Um, and so having some skills to go with that is helpful. We found that uh, to be extremely true within this time of us needing to shift our curriculum to be more digital. Um, it's super helpful when a, when a student has that uh, type of skill there. Um, some self-advocacy skills is what we're looking for. Um, to be able to say uh, why 
um, they're feeling a certain way or not necessarily why, but that they are feeling a certain way and they need to, to address that will help them um, to, to cope with social situations and different things like that. But we need to, to have a little bit of self-advocacy within the student as well. Um, along with that, we ask for uh, emotional self-regulation like the others were not a therapeutic program. And so we um, really need to, to be able to have a student that can identify their emotions and um, to, to work through some of that with our help. Um, we have counselors on our campus that any university student can take advantage of, including RISE students, but um, will help facilitate those conversations, but we need them to be able to identify some of those things. Um, and then we don't have, uh, we do have resident advisors who help our students within the dorm rooms. Uh, we have advisors that help them within classrooms and advisors that help them at their internship sites, but we don't have supervision of our students 24 seven. And so we, we need our students to be able to have a sense of autonomy um, so that they can have good general hygiene, whether that's with the checklist, we, we can help them to give reminders, but for them to be able to do those daily hygienic tasks themselves, um, keep track of their belongings, we, the ability to um, navigate a college campus uh, independently, we'll give them some assistance with that, but ultimately handing that off for them to be able to navigate themselves. Um, and then some type of time management um, is what we're looking for as well, to be able to say, I, I can get up on time, I can get to my class on time, and I have a general idea about due dates and saying, okay, this assignment's due on Monday, I need to have it done by Monday. Um, those are kind of the things that we're really looking for for students coming into our program. Eric, did you have, uh, you wanna answer that question as well? Yeah. Um, so for us, same thing, 18 or older have completed high school. We um, don't have an age cap. Uh, most of our students are in their younger 20s, just you know, based on being a college program and transition, as the others were mentioning. Um, but we don't have an age cap with that. And, and our admissions process is that for the paperwork, it's similar to what Tim was saying, where we, we have our own application, then we have some reference forms that the student fills out. And then we also request their most recent IEP and psych eval. We prefer to have those within the last two to four years. And then their transcripts as well. And as far as the admissions process goes, um, well, until COVID happened, we would have them do an overnight visit for two days with us and just experience what it's like to be a student. They would do math and reading assessments with us. And then a mixture of the paper trail plus their visit on campus would be reviewed together by our application review team to determine the student's acceptance. Uh, moving forward, we're doing that overnight opportunity in a virtual way. And so um, our staff are actually having their last day today. So moving forward for the summer and next year, we're going to be um, revisiting what that looks like. But inevitably, it'll be a uh, paper trail, all the paperwork, and then doing our virtual visit with us. As far as math and reading levels go, we'd probably be pretty similar. We used to say second and third grade math and reading level, but I also don't want that to deter a student from applying to our program. Um, we do serve students from a wide, wide range of um, ability levels. And so um, our main thing is we're very career focused. Where can they identify keywords and key symbols to be able to work in the job field? Um, those are some things we're looking at um, being very career driven. And then as far as living on campus goes, um, the question about medications, we have a full time RN and a full time LPM uh, within our nursing department. And so all of our staff, we're a 24 seven staff program. So we have staff who are here during the day, of course, in classes and then our evening staff and then staff who sleep overnight as well. The goal is if a student cannot pass medication, the goal is to get them to that point. If they can't, um, our staff and our nursing department would be able to handle that as well. Um, and then also, as mentioned by the others, um, hygiene is important. So um, as you know, can they shower by themselves, brush their teeth, you know, those, those morning and evening routines. We'll do verbal prompts for sure. Um, we're all about that um, and assisting students, but we're not gonna be doing anything um, beyond that with our students. Um, I think that's about it uh, with our admissions criteria, so yeah. Great, thanks Eric. Uh, I did wanna also mention the, the question that was in the chat about uh, medication management for our program. We, um, we do ask that our students are able to, to manage their medications appropriately, um, whether that's we can help them to, to give reminders or make sure that they uh, set timers or however they need to do that, we'll help them to manage that, but ultimately that responsibility would be on them. And we talk with the families about that as well. Uh, a lot of our incoming students are, are still working on 
making sure that they um, have a good system in place for that. And so we'll partner with the families to help with that. Um, I do, we, we did have a student who was changing medication and actually needed injections um, for that. We were able to work with our uh, wellness center. We do have a nurse who's on campus four days a week and a doctor who comes once a week. And so um, on those four days, that student would go to the nurse and the nurse would administer the injections. Um, and then that particular student would go home on weekends and the family would administer them. And so um, if there is a case like that, we can work with the families to help with that. But generally, we would like the, the medication management to be um, the responsibility for the student. Um, I know, uh, Elizabeth, I don't know if you wanted to add anything in response to that question. Yeah, thank you. So everything that you said, Drew, so it's very similar for us as well. We, we do um, expect students to be independent in the medical management and follow the scaffolding approach. So some students perhaps need a reminder from their resident advisor in the morning to actually take it or perhaps um, a medical case that then has the different alarms on it on the phones. And then we do um, daily check-ins to ensure that it's on track um, to be able to support the student and independently taking the med medical, any medicine that they're taking, so. Great. And so um, as we, we look at the different skills that are needed coming into a program, what would you say the priority is? For you? Would it be those uh, functional independence skills or the, the academic skills in um, those sides? And how would you suggest um, the transition program educators and, and special educators within their system help our students develop those skills? I can speak into that a little bit to begin. Um, sure. So at, at Shepherd's, academics and functional skills, you know, they're both um, equally important in their own ways. Um, but we've already talked about hygiene kind of being a baseline, I think, for most of us. But beyond that, something important for our students and the way that our program is modeled as they go for us through the dorm, the hall, and the apartment, we have responsibility charts. And it's broken down by the kitchen area, the living area, their room, and their bathroom. And they start out by doing small tasks at a time um, throughout the week. And then as they go to the hall, they'll do more. The apartment, they'll do more. And so for us, what we always tell um, families and educators is to start by doing some sort of regimented schedule, whether it's starting with small life skills tasks at a time of taking care of your own area. Those are things that are really important, especially as they're coming into Shepherds and they're going to be doing a lot um, in teams to begin, but then throughout the three years, slowly taking more and more ownership. Um, we used to call them chores and now we call them responsibilities because there's, there's more ownership for our students when they hear that they have a responsibility rather than a chore, which can have a negative connotation to it. Um, so that's, that's kind of just a basic answer on, on functional skills. And then um, academics are, are important as well. And uh, with, with us, our academics with math and reading, we don't actually teach math and reading specifically, but we have life skills classes that are very practical um, to life skills and social skills where reading and math are involved. Our math classes more so have to do with money management um, so things like we have a Dairy Queen and the subway across the street. And so we'll do assignments where we'll get a menu and sit down with students and go through a budget. How much money do you have? What can you afford? If you spend this much on Monday, what will you have left on Friday? Things like that. We're not really doing math beyond money management and finances with our student because we want that to be practical skills that they're going to take with them. So um, as far as academics and functional skills, that would be um, a little bit of insight that I would have um, in regards to the way our program runs. Great, thank you. Yeah, I know with the RISE program, um, the priority for us in terms of what skills would we need for our students to, to have coming in would definitely be the functional independence. Um, the, the academic skills are important in terms of uh, helping our students to participate within the environments of the college campus. Um, but like Shepherds was what Eric was talking about is most of our um, academic skills are going to be focused on those those life skills as well. And so budgeting, money management, um, the the reading and the writing, we incorporate that within our curriculum for our um, rise classes. But um, we're not so much focused on uh, proper grammar in those things and, and uh, grading it based on that, but we're more grading it based on content and understanding of the material that we're talking about. Um, we do, uh, as I was saying earlier, we have our students 
they participate in traditional undergraduate classes. They take that as an audit. Um, our, our students don't uh, get any credit towards college classes because um, our program specifically serves those with intellectual disabilities. They would not otherwise be qualified to receive college credit. And so um, our program, we audit traditional undergraduate classes and the purpose for them auditing Um, the purpose of them participating there is to uh, help them understand how to uh, function within a traditional undergraduate setting, or to function within a classroom with typically developing peers. And so that's our main purpose and goal within that. And so that, that academic skill, it is important um, in order for them to participate, but it's really not at the forefront of what we prioritize in terms of what we're teaching and, and what we think student needs to come in, into the program with. Tim, uh, Elizabeth, did you want to add to any of that? I did, I don't want to, but Elizabeth, you're, you're welcome to go first if you want. Too late, I'm going. So uh, we, uh, I should have mentioned as part of our admission requirements, the thing about wanting to come to college. Um, I, I always think that's sort of a given, but it is worth kind of reiterating that, that the desire to come, it's the students desire to come. We, we did turn somebody down this year who clearly did not want to come to college. He just wants to get a job, doesn't want to, you know, the whole interview, he was just sort of like, nah, but his parents really, really wanted this for the kid. And, and in the perfect world where the parents want that, um, we get where they're coming from but the kid won't succeed if they don't want to do it. And then in terms of, you know, the academics do matter with us a fair bit, especially where it comes to reading. Um, you know, it doesn't have to, you know, we're not like a brick wall with that third grade thing. It just seems to be a good place to draw a line in the sand, but we really like to see that they can read and they do have some comprehension skills because that affects how we do everything else and opportunities within the program. So that's an important as we still work on those skills and we do have some math and then depending on the student's interest and what they have access to across the board in the college, all of that matters, but it starts the most with the, with the reading because so much of the job piece in the program is the sort of virtual job hunting process which is email and you'll be able to do communications quickly and those kinds of things and spontaneity and stuff like that. So all of that sort of feeds into that. Um, in terms of, of what we're kind of looking for. And then that navigation piece too, it's, that's a harder one to, to sort of gauge. And there's a lot of leeway, you know, the student wants to be here, there's probably gonna be more chance for that student than the student who's just sort of indifferent or not interested or, or whatever. Um, but they need to be able to find their way around campus or at least have capacity to learn that within a few weeks, um, those kinds of things, because we don't have aids where, you know, there's a lot of, we're really trying to build independence and so forth with our program. Yes, so uh, thank you, Tim. So what many of the things that Tim said, very similar in that, you know, again, there is a different student who will move through many things when they really want to live on their own. They want to live independently. And so they'll really continue to work towards whatever skill sets that are necessary. So that's really important. Um, and like Tim, we've had families where the family wanted it and the student not so much. And so, um, you know, just perhaps not a student that's going to be, uh, that's going to have the level of success that's possible inside of our program. So we would defer someone like that. As for our classes, so many of my colleagues have talked about reading levels and things like that. And we certainly have a range of reading levels that our students are in. However, we do have students who are, um, who have lower reading levels than that. And so where we will work with them on, vir on a virtual checklist and what does that actually look like um, again applying in real life um, as a residential program and in real life what does it actually look like to problem solve throughout the program and so we'll do money management where they are actually working with cash and not that not 
whatever Apple wallet is like on their, on their phone. Um, we'll take them grocery shopping to ensure that they know what is it like to live within a budget and what is it like to be able to purchase their breakfast and their lunch within a certain number of dollars and to be able to budget what life looks like. So all of our academics are really wrapped around what does it look like in life? Whether it is problem solving where you don't know the answer to, you know, who do I ask for the next task at work to, um, this is how much money I have and how do I do all the things I want to do this week and what does that look like? So time management and budgeting and really all the things when you take a look at the skills you have in your own life and balancing priorities and who should you speak to and the way that you talk to your friends is not necessarily the way that you talk to your colleagues. All of those things we are are there with them uh, within the three-year time period and all of our courses are focused inside of that so but not so much of the again the academic piece because again they're not going for um, a degree they're going for the life skills necessary to be successful great thank you Elizabeth um, as, as we were touching on a little bit of what our curriculum kind of looks like. And so if you want a full in depth on what each of our curriculum is like, you can feel free to reach out, um, to each of us, um, specifically, but we, uh, uh I'd love for us to just kind of touch on what, what our curriculum really does look like. What, what does a post-secondary, uh, program look like for, uh, our, our students? And so I'll go ahead and start. You guys can, can. Ex Excuse me, Andrew. It would be. I, thank you, everyone. I just had a related question to the academic skill piece, and that's the use of assistive technology. You know, do our students using text to speech, speech to text, things like that, to compensate for some of their those maybe more traditional reading and writing skills, and is that appropriate on your campuses? Yeah. I can answer that for me and then we can we can go through the others um, for the rise program. We have had students who use the, the speech to text and some other um, adaptive technology uh, that they have in their own just based on their own um, accommodations that they need. And so we uh, really take a, a, an accommodation approach to that. And so we'll talk with our um, faculty about what is appropriate for our students to be using and, and what they can um, Use in order to complete the tasks that they they need to complete. And so for us, it's really about um, understanding what you need to do in order to complete what you need to complete. And so whether that's uh, to complete the job that you're in your internship for, if it's to complete the assignment that you have, or to communicate appropriately with the people around you, um, we really want to help our students find ways to uh, understand what they need to use in order to get those things done. And so we're not gonna necessarily limit a student to say, you can't use that piece of technology in order to complete this assignment um, because ultimately when they're out of our program, they're gonna need that in order to, to do that. And so um, that, that's how we, we approach that in particular. Anybody else wants to add into that, feel free. Yeah, we, we're pretty flexible in, in trying to work individually with the student based on what their needs are. Um, we have a relationship with Read and Write Gold where uh, someone had purchased that software package for us. So we tend to use that a lot for folks who do better with listening than reading, for example, or, or, or you know, talk to text. We're big fans of a lot of Apple products are pretty simple to use in terms of speaking using Siri and or, you know, pressing control, what's it, I forget the command exactly on a, on a Mac um, to, to speak to text. So, you know, each student is sort of different. We don't give them their own iPads though, Andrew, and I understand you're gonna give us all iPads for being at this webinar today. Um, I like making promises for my kids. Um, but whatever, whatever we, we can do, we, we also, with our uh, access disability coordinator, you know, in terms of recording lectures, um, we're big. We all we don't necessarily require everyone to have a cell phone, but it's strongly encouraged because we're using Office 365 and using Microsoft Office and using a lot of these technology tools. We start working on that from the word go. So whatever adaptations we need to make with our students, or if they're more comfortable with PC, or they're more you know, we we are pretty flexible with that. Yeah, just to add to that, so. Um, at PACE, our students do receive an iPad as well as um, Fitbit watches to be able to assist oh, them in health so and wellness. Oh, so free Fitbits for everyone, too. Good. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> That's awful nice of you. 
and important for them to know heart rate and what does that look like, right? So, um, but you know, so many of our students uh, are using assistive technology prior to coming to us. And so, um, you know, whatever that they've used that they've found success with, we're going to take a look like, how do we incorporate that? And so it really is um, providing what, what assistance is needed um, to be able to assist a student where they're at. So exactly what Drew said, we're not gonna be with them. That's the whole point for them to be able to be on their own and to be able to navigate independently, writing that email to their boss or sending that text message to an employer or a coworker. And so whatever technology is going to assist them in being confident and being able to do something and get what they need, um, we are absolutely going to incorporate that. Well, Tim, I hate to say this, but all of our students get Chromebooks, so. <laughs> Nobody wants those. You'll be <laughs> Sorry, not as cool as an iPad, I guess. No, but all of our students get Chromebooks. And then when it comes to adaptive technology, absolutely, um, similar to the other programs, we'll individualize it to help students get, you know, what they need to be successful within the program. And at Shepherds, each student has an advisor who's kind of their main point of contact and also the main point of contact kind of between the student and the parents. And so as they're going throughout the year, if we notice things that a student's gonna need to be more successful, that's gonna be a conversation that we're gonna have with the student and the parents right away to ensure that you know, they have what's appropriate for them to um, be, be in our program and interact in the classes and in the student life setting as well. Great. Well, yeah, I, um, as we were talking about the different types of uh, skills that we're looking for in students, I'd, I'd just love for us to touch on a little bit about uh, what, what do we teach in our programs so that um, educators who are here can know what our, what our programs are offering to their students. And so I'll go ahead and start and you guys can, can follow me. But um, for the RISE program, we have, we have four different categories that our classes fall into. And so uh, the first one is independent living skills. And so that's going to talk about um, you know, cooking, um, cooking, cleaning, all those different things, personal hygiene, um, talk about um, how to, uh, sorry, I just looked at my next one. I'll just skip on that because I'm blanking on that. Sorry about that. The, uh, the next one is personal, person-centered planning. And so those kind of go together because we want to focus on what the student uh, really desires in, in their um, future path. And so we work with them to, to self-advocate on what they want to do. And so we have concentrations within our program uh, that focus in on, we have six different concentrations that our students can pick from. And this is really looking at, okay, what are they interested in? Uh, what are their skills? What, what um, things do they want to do uh, in the future? And then we gear their internships and uh, traditional classes that they audit to those specific um, concentrations. And so all of that is within our person-centered planning curriculum. And so we work with them within their first semester to self-advocate what they would like to um, focus on for the rest of their time in our program. Uh, we also do personal fitness and wellness. And so we make sure that our students understand uh, what it's like to um, eat healthy, what that means, and, and make good food choices. But then also we have specific times for uh, them to go to uh, the fitness center and to, to work out um, scheduled times within uh, their day for them to go and keep their bodies healthy. Uh, we put that as an emphasis in our program. And then we also focus on professional skills, uh, talking about how to prepare for the, um, the work environment, what, what places they would want to go to. And then ultimately, we start helping them to um, look at jobs that they would want to pursue after our program. Uh, somebody in the chat was asking about what the six concentrations are. We have um, business and entrepreneurship. We do Christian ministries. Creative arts, which can be either visual, instrumental, or um, vocal for our students. We have education, um, health and wellness, and then uh, math and technology. And so uh, our very first semester is geared toward figuring out which of those six our students would like to concentrate in. And then that can change if they, their interests change throughout the year, but um, that kind of focuses in on where we would want to put them on their on-campus and off-campus internships and what types of traditional classes they'd like to go into. Um, so that's just a very brief overview of what we kind of teach in our program. Um, and if you have any specific questions on that, feel free when we send out our contact information to reach out to me and I can answer any of those for you. Um, I'll, I'll just direct it toward Tim and he can answer that uh, a little bit 
for for Elsa. You bet. Um, I distracted him by texting my address for my iPad Pro with a pencil, if you please. Thanks. So Elsa, we tend to be in three areas. It's really four, but with three sounds nicer. But academics and career exploration are kind of our biggest umbrella. And we kind of think of it as sort of, you know, like they have six concentrations. We have sort of three tenets that sort of guide the way we do our curriculum. So academics and career exploration, independent living skills, and social recreational skills. And a lot of the social recreational stuff, while we do have some social communication classes and those things within the in the first year or two, um, a lot of that is more on life in campus, living on the dorms, joining clubs. We require our students to go to uh, three to five activities per week. They're required to join a club on campus and, and maybe more than one, depending on how social they are, um, and kind of get involved in the campus life right away. So that sort of lives under that umbrella. The curriculum is going to have a lot with the, the independent living. So that's the social communication. That's there is a, a healthy living skills class, which is more of the physical fitness. And then there's a whole series of courses and financial smarts, which is budgeting and dealing with money. And I think someone else had already talked about dealing with cash. We do a lot of that too, but then it levels up every year into the last year we're talking about rents and we even get in the stock market stuff because we have a, a financial wizard guy who teaches those series of courses for our program. Um, then the big thing is going to be in the career piece. Um, so the career piece is starts with sort of career exploration, and then there's also a social and community uh, class or community and citizenship class, excuse me, that, that deals with kind of giving back and volunteering and working in the communities, and they work together to sort of build skills towards moving off campus, and that's internships, job interviewing, shadowing, all that kind of stuff as, as we go further in the program. And in the latter two years, a lot of their time in our curriculum is going to be built around actual getting experience either on campus or off in terms of, uh, you know, they have classes that are just internship classes. We try to get our students into at least four internships so we can help it throughout their process. Some of those may just be on campus jobs early on. Kind of depends on the skill sets and interests of the students. You know, like all of us, we are all working with very individualized populations and we're all fairly small programs so we can be a little unique in how we do that. Um, and then there's electives and the electives tend to have a lot of that gen ed feel that college has. And that's gonna be like, there's an investigation in science class. There's a the healthy living too is more of a gym class where it's learning with, with um, the health center and working out and those kinds of things. I teach a speech class, a speech theater class. Uh, so it's a little bit more fun. The communication piece of it is more towards professional presentations and how everybody's going to be stuck in a Zoom box for their future. But we do it through fun and, and theater and those kinds of things as well. We've done video game design classes. We've done art classes. Um, every year we kind of offer something a little bit different. And then, of course, our students have access to college classes that may cater to very specific interests. We had a recent alum. Uh, get a certificate of completion in graphic design. He did several art classes throughout his time at, our, at the college. We had someone else do that with business classes. Other students have done it with education and English classes. Another guy did it with Spanish. So there's a lot of unique uh, individualization available through our, our access to Elmhurst. Great. So um, again, what you're hearing is very similar. We're really focusing on all of our programs are focusing on those uh, independent living skills, the, the employment piece. The way that we have it structured out is our students start off with us two days a week in functional academic classes, so Mondays and Wednesdays. And there is my new adopted dog, uh, wants to say hello. Uh, and then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, um, from the very beginning, they go into an internship. And that internship um, will really be determined on one of our partnership sites if it's available, but also what the student's interested in. So they get to explore how I thought I'd like that. Well, that's not what I thought I'd like. Right? So all everything that we experienced on our first day on the job, on, on our first job going, well, this is not what I thought it was. And so they get their their feed in immediately. And so you want to think about the functional academics as the conversation piece, the discussion piece, and then everything else around the program is then the, them experiencing that conversation in life. And so we'll have that money management. And then throughout that week, they are spending the money they budgeted on their groceries. They're spending the money on the activity that they have on Saturday, or they're spending money on long-term goal in terms of savings 
or their social planning. So we have a social skills class. And so they're going to do a mind map. You know, how do you get agreement on everybody wanting to do the same thing? And what is it going to cost? And how long is it going to take to get there? And what am I supposed to wear when I get there? So all of those pieces that go along. And then the Saturday activity is then built upon that exercise that they did in class. And so then the health and wellness functional uh, uh, class that they'd have on Mondays and Wednesdays as they learn about heart rate, they would then in the health and wellness um, at, go to the fitness facility with the residence advisors or staffs and look and and look you know go to the treadmill or decide to go for running or go for a walk whatever that it is to see what does it take to get to that healthy heart rate so it really is the conversation in those functional academic classes on those Mondays and Wednesdays you know talking about what does it look like for something healthy and then the actual living of creating the, the uh, purchasing the groceries and then the food prep so um that it that's how the our program is structured and if my fitbit could be purple i appreciate that it's a popular color <laughs> uh, uh so here at shepherds we have um, our core academics then we have our vocational training and so some of our core academics are classes like communications independent learning skills daily living skills Intro to Computers, Applied Technology, Money Management, Employment Readiness, Health Class, and there's a long list more, but that's just kind of a handful. And then we have our vocational training, and I mentioned our three majors. So we do culinary arts, horticulture, and technology. Now, the way that that works all three years is that students come in their first year, and they're going to be taking a handful of our life skills, our core classes, to begin. They'll do an intro to culinary arts, horticulture, and technology in their first semester. Um, when they come back their second semester, they will then have declared the major that they would like to go in and continue that all three years. Now their second year, they spend about half the amount of time in class, in core classes that continue to year two. The other half is gonna be in their vocational class that they've already declared. Year three, Monday through Thursday, they do internships either on campus or in the and Fridays is their third year classes. And so you kind of go from doing a lot of life skills at the beginning, and then as you go through the three years, it becomes more and more vocational focus for the students. And also what they learn in their life skills class, they are then going to be living out in the living areas, whether it's the dorms, the halls, the apartments. Um, and with our different majors, what students get when they graduate with us, so our curriculum is backed by the, uh, it's accredited through the Council on Occupational Education. Um, so they're an accreditor that it's a lot of different programs around the nation and some um, associate programs as well. Um, but what they're getting when they graduate is that they are now certified through our accreditor to work in that job field. And then um, that qualifies them you know, for a job in that field and we'll work with them to find employment in that area. So um, that's one of our distinctives there, just being with the three very specific vocations that we teach um, here at Shepherds. And then with that, Eric, I know that um, because of, of those certifications, it'd be good for the, the educators to know this, because of, of that particular, um, uh, you being able to, to be accredited in that way, your students do qualify for some uh, aid in that as well financially, is that correct? Right, yeah, so our full accreditation, that opens up the door for students for full FAFSA if they have a diploma from high school, so grants, um, loans, and federal work study. Um, thanks for bringing that up. That's, that's one of our biggest pieces that opens up the door for our students. Um, not only what they get when they graduate, but how it can help them also pay for the program as well. Yeah. yeah. And so the other three programs, um, myself, Elsa, and, and Pace, uh, we are uh, certified comprehensive transition programs. And so we do also qualify for federal aid in that way. Um, however, because our students are not degree seeking, they do not qualify for student loans. And so they can qualify for grants through FAFSA. Um, but they would not qualify for, for student loans that way. And so just so you can, can know that those are additional um, opportunities for, for aid in uh, finances like that. Um, we did have a, a question come in that talks about, um, can, can any of us talk to uh, some available data we have on students and their achieving employment after graduation? I'll speak really quickly on that. We are in our um, fourth year of our program. And so we're actually only a year out now um, from our first graduating class and so we're still collecting that data um, on our program specifically. I can say that we have 
Um, out of the eight that have graduated, I do know that five have um, seeked uh, gainful employment for paid employment, and two went on to um, further vocational programs uh, to help foster um, their vocational skills that way. And so um, aside from us having official data, that's the data we have for the RISE program. Um, if anybody else wants to, to add into um, their, their data metrics, go ahead. We're, uh, last three years, we've been at about 90% of our graduating classes seeking uh, employment. Most of those were full-time jobs. We're still working through, this year has obviously been extraordinarily challenging. We have seen some successes and so forth. Um, we've had a pretty aggressive career coordinator uh, help us with that. So uh, years prior to that, it may not have been quite 90%. Um, just in case anyone's looking for a job, our career coordinator has landed an amazing position elsewhere so we're gonna probably be looking for that person uh, in the next month or so. So uh, if you like working really hard, long hours and not get paid too much. Uh, so for us, uh, you know, so Pace at National Lewis University has been around since 1986. So, but I'll speak to uh, in the last five years for our employment rates, um, and we'll be conducting a new survey um, to be able to update the data. But for the last five years of graduates, our employment rate and they're employed now, um, our employment rate is 75% of our graduates um, are in paid employment. Yeah, and with employment at Shepherds, we usually fall around 85% of our graduates each year. And with our accreditation, with each cohort that graduates, 70% or more of each student, each major have to find a job at minimum wage or higher within a year and a half after graduating with us. Um, so that's kind of our commitment to the student to help them find a job in the field. It can be part-time or full-time, it just has to be a minimum wage or higher and so we're working with students in that, that regard. Our most recent report, so we've been around 10 years, is from 2011 to 2018, um, which is around 90% of our grads found employment. Now this, this last year, for the first time, we did not hit 70% in our horticulture program, but we had about six graduate and two of them had some um, pretty big life changes take place that deterred them from getting a job. One of them is taking care of her grandmother full time at home as they move to a new small town. So that's um, the, the good thing is a lot of the skills she's using are skills she learned with us. The bad news is that doesn't count towards accreditation, but um, we have a full plan in place um, with them to um, get our numbers back up moving forward. So just a little bit of an off year, but typically overall it's about 85% of our students each, within the year and a half. Awesome. We had another question, we'll, we can go in reverse order, so I'll start with Eric on this, about um, average student to staff ratio in your classes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, so at Shepherds, on average, it's uh, one, one staff to eight students or so, and that would be in the living areas as well. Um, we actually, as a program, we have about 95 total staff and 95 students, but they're not always working with the students. That's including administration, business advancement, so on and so forth. Um, but it's about one to eight in the classroom and sometimes even more than that. So depending on the class, we might have two or three paraprofessionals in a classroom. And so we're, we're kind of, get as we get to know students more, we get to know those who need more supports, who need less supports. And so we're gonna kind of move and shuffle staff around to make sure that needs are being met um, you know, where they need to be. The one area on our campus where you wouldn't see a one to eight ratio would be in the apartment setting. In our apartments, we have a row of male apartments and a row of female apartments. And so we'll have a male and a female staff. Um, it might be close to one day, but sometimes one to 10 or one to 12, but they're just bouncing in and out doing rounds. By the time a student is in the apartment on campus, um, they've shown the responsibility to be in that apartment. Um, so we're not just putting students there and then checking in on them randomly. If, if we know that they, they can be there by that point. <laughs> so just want to clarify that, but one to eight is the, the general. Great. Elizabeth, do you want to speak to your class size? Yes, absolutely. So um, at Pace, we accept students one time per year. So we they start in a cohort. 
Uh, and historically, our cohort size is between 15 and 17. So if we're taking a look at the functional academic classes that they start off in in their first year on that Monday and Wednesday, it would be one full-time member, uh, one full-time staff member, one, you know, a full-time instructor to that cohort. So that would be between anywhere between 15 and 17 students. Um, every place else that rate that can be a, a significantly smaller range. So when their independent living skills, when their instructor comes to their student apartments, it's going to be a one on one. The job coaching would be a one on one, but the actual functional academic classes would be with their cohort. So it would be one to 15 or 17. Great. Our ours is pretty similar to that. We we do a cohort um, style for our, our students. And so our cohorts are usually between eight and 12 students. And so that would be them within their RISE specific classes would be um, eight to 12 uh, per professor. Um, when they go into their traditional undergraduate class, we have a um, student advisor who goes with them. Uh, we call them a learning advisor. And so this is a undergraduate student of the university who's paid to um, help our student in terms of note taking or um, test proctoring or helping them understand the material. And so that would be a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, sometimes we do two students to one advisor if there's two people taking that class, uh, two of our students taking that class. Um, job coaching would be one-on-one. -on -one, and then we have resident advisors as well. Again, traditional undergraduate students who are paid to assist our students within the dorms. Um, and that would be a, a two-to-one uh, student to um, advisor ratio for, for us. For ELSA, our average class size is probably hovers between 9 and 12, depending on the year. The incoming group is 15, typically, um, sometimes a little bigger, sometimes a little smaller. They tend to go through that first year together. It's not a formal cohort because there can be exceptions. If somebody has a really high math ability, they might not take our fundamental math class, etc. Um, as year two, three, and four evolve, then it becomes more like a traditional college experience. So there's a lot of mix and match and not everybody has the same classes and so on. Um, there's resident, we call our resident advisors community advisors and we tend to go one to seven for that. Um, we have eight or nine adjunct faculty that support the four of us who are with the program. Uh, well, three of us that are full-time and me who's I'm part-time with them. Uh, and then um, the traditional classes on Elmhurst tend to be 17 to 24 in size. So we don't really have giant classes anywhere in, in, in the school. And do you want me to go ahead and hit that next question, Andrew? Yeah, please do. So the talking. question, yeah, the question that we're, uh, we can all just go through this is, did we um, help our students uh, to acquire any um, adult services after, after graduating with us? And so Tim, go ahead and speak on that for you. Yeah. We, we have had relationships with DRS. Um, they obviously don't fund my students that come to the ELSA program uh, because of a certificate program, though they have worked with some of my degree seeking students who qualify for their benefits. Um, we do have an agent that's assigned to work with us. Um, we tend to do a lot of our placements and job coaching support and all those kinds of things internally. And then we might encourage families like, you know, obviously Ray Graham is an organization that's similar to that, that works in the DuPage area that, that supports some of our alumni, you know, kind of as a, after a handoff over time, maybe with some of that life coaching and things like that. Um, we try to handle those things and we allow our alums to come back and visit with us. Um, we have like a formal meeting every month and then we have a social event we try to sponsor for our alums uh, once a month as well. So that there's always opportunities to come back and work with us or come back and work with a career person if students are struggling in those kinds of things. So they still have a relationship with us even when they graduate. And with our recent grads, we always try to stick with them until we get them something. We tend not to, to give up on them unless they absolutely don't or can't. You know, like Eric's situation with that student, we had something similar, except it was knee surgeries. So she wasn't really able to get into the job market until eight months after she graduated, but then we landed her a position. So we continue to work with them, but we'll encourage them to work with DRS if they want to. And we, like I said, we've had relationship with those folks in our program. Yeah, for the, for the RISE program, we don't have um, particular relationships with any of the adult services um, specifically w linked to us. We, what we like to do in our program is to partner with the families to help support those systems because we realize that they are the ones that are gonna, that are gonna be helping their student uh, after being with us. And so we will help to um, give them the information to 
pursue those opportunities. But ultimately for us, if, if the family's not involved with that and uh, the student isn't able to, to negotiate those types of things on their own, we really think that uh, they're going to be the ones driving that force. And so we try to give them the information as much as possible um, and, and help work with them and partner with them in those things. But we as a program don't have relationships speci specifically with those um, institutions. Yep, so um, so very similar to what Drew said. And so while we don't have specific um, connections with adult services, as I shared earlier, we do have we have our own services once they've completed the certificate program with Pace Ahead and Pace Beyond. We also launched this year the Alumni Advisory Board. And so I'm really committed to continuing to assist our alumni in growing in their connection to their community and the leadership skills that's going to allow them to thrive. And so um, I'm working with the the advisory board, which is made up of alumni, that um, to be able to take a look at what are the what are they looking for. So we already have a social element in place for our alumni that they participate in, but what else is required? And it's going to really come from them in terms of what they need and what they're looking for. Um, and so those are the things that we offer to our students once they've completed the program. Uh, and of course, we're here to assist and have conversation with whatever is that's needed, but connecting them directly to our services, not something that we offer. And at Shepherds, we have, uh, we have an alumni program and then we also have a full-time employment specialist that's um, specifically helping students find jobs after they graduate. And so a lot of times the advisor who's been working with the student for those last three years they've been with us, um, all the knowledge that they have of the student and the family will then get passed on to our employment specialist to help them find a job. And um, we're not necessarily connected to anyone. And I think most people on this call are probably from Illinois, but in Wisconsin, we have um, DVR and other long-term care agencies, and we can direct families towards those offices if that's something they're looking for. And the same thing if they're from um, Illinois, we don't have an exact contact or anything, but similar to other programs, a baseline knowledge of the services out there where if a family really needed a contact, you know, we could, we could provide that, but we're not specifically connected. We work specifically with, um, from our employment specialist and our alumni program to the student and the family in that way. Great. I have, I have one last question for, uh, that we have prepared. We're coming up on our, our end of time here. So if, if you have any further questions that you want us to cover, please put them in the chat. We'll try and cover them before we close our time here. But as we're talking about um, preparing students to, to come to post-secondary programs, I'd love to hear from, from each of us, um, what would be uh, the makeup of a good fit student? Who, who would be the ideal candidate for uh, your program, for our educators to be setting their students up for success within your programs. And so I can go ahead and start with that. For, for us, um, the big thing for us is really to have a student who is, has a strong desire to have a college experience and to live on a college campus, um, to learn what independent living skills come from that, um, and to, to be a motivated student. That's really a, a main priority for for us. Um, another big thing for us is, is partnerships with our parents and having um, parents who are on board with the students and, and walking alongside them. That's another really big um, thing for us as we look at students coming into our program. And then ultimately we want our students um, to be able to have self-determined goals. We want them to, to be um, having goals outside of uh, the, the college program, not just coming to college just to be in college, but be able to, to learn how to live independently and want to be independent after, afterwards. Um, our students are only going to be successful if they really have that drive to be um, successful in, in those areas of independent living and vocational skills. And so uh, those are really the students that are the ideal candidates for, for our program. So I'll go next. So it seems like I want all of uh, Judson's students. Uh, so <laughs> all of his, all of his. Um, so really, I think what you're going to find what we're what we're all looking for inside of a post secondary program, and just to highlight is really what any student, whether or not they're coming to a college experience program or not, is what do they want. And so if they want to live on their own, 
great. We uh, live independently, more than just live on their own, but live independently to be able to have the skills necessary to navigate through life um, really makes a tremendous difference. What that looks like, what we've pointed to earlier on is that emotional independence. We're located downtown Chicago. Uh, so being able to navigate, to be able to manage on some level, and again, uh, our program provides support for that as well based upon where they're at, but someone who is going to be able to be self-aware enough to know, to be able to know that we're here to assist them if they're in a situation that they're uncomfortable with. So that is um, really the big pieces that makes all of the difference. Everything else is manageable or workable or a program that will fit for them, but ultimately it really comes down to do they want it. Um, and so then I see the question, what's the average cost for your respective programs? Um, so I'll answer that since I, I, I'm here. And so the cost of our program is 45,000 per academic year. And so we are on a quarter system. So our students go to school um, summer, or excuse me, fall, winter, and spring. They're off for the summertime. And so that includes the housing and um, food plan as well as the academic cost. Um, what funding options are available? Drew mentioned that as a comprehensive transition program. Our families are eligible to um, apply. They are able to apply for the FAFSA. And if they're eligible for federal grants, they're able to utilize that to be able to assist with um, in covering the cost of the program. Um, certainly private pay. We have internal scholarships available as well that our families can apply for annually. And of course, if they have a 529 or ABLE plan, they're able to apply those, um, those that funding as well. I'll speak into the, the question about what a um, ideal candidate looks like. It's a very hard question to answer because all of our students are so different. I think for all of our programs, we would say the same. I think a willingness to be, a willingness to learn and a willingness to be involved in a community is important. But on the, on the flip side of that, as part of being um, both a service provider and even as educators, you'll see a student's potential before they do. That happens so often. And I, it, the struggle for me being at a lot of these college fairs is we have that title college. And a lot of our families walk by and their students see the name college and initially keep walking because they think it's not an option or, oh, my son's not going to college. And my encouragement would be that um, to push families to at least look at our programs because I think there's more services um, that are provided that you might not see right away um, before exploring. Um, so. What I'm saying is we've had students who didn't think they were gonna be a candidate for our program. They were really scared the first time they came to campus. And those have been some of our most successful students that we've had through the program. And so as daunting as it can be to see that word college and for some families not to put two and two together, I think it's really important to explore those, those opportunities out there in regards to all four of our programs. So that's just one of my things that I wanted to mention. As far as the cost goes, um, our cost is 48700 a year, and there's different ways that families can pay for that. The first is state agencies or programs. Um, and so we actually have had a few students from Illinois um, use their DRS funds towards our program. Um, and that's a select few, and they had to go through an appeal process for that. But outside of Illinois, if they're in other states, different, um, whether it's in Wisconsin, DVR, or long-term care agencies they can use towards the program, we give a needs-based scholarship to students, so that's our internal scholarship. We have external scholarships listed on our website. Um, students um, can use their social security income and just use that to go towards their room and board as they'd like. And then FAFSA, um, as we mentioned earlier, so um, grants, um, Shepherds College, we work with full loans. So whether it's um, student loans or parent plus loans, um, we'll work with those as well and federal work study, so. And I'm going to go because I got to go in a minute here. So, <laughs> um, and in terms of there's not a whole lot of difference in, as far as what the student we want is going to fit. The enthusiasm piece is a big part of that wanting to come to college. I feel like the, between the four of us, for example, it, it really becomes about fit for the environment. Do you want the city? Do you want the Judson experience? Do you want the Wisconsin experience? You know, each of us have a nice campus. They have a nice, an interesting, unique fit. So there's that sort of abstract thing. It's hard to hard to decide. 
um, you know, what's best for them. But our student wants to come and have the four-year college experience, you know, similar to RISE. They want to be in the dorms. They want to see the sports or be, in, in my school, you can actually participate in college athletics if you're capable of that. Um, you have to be able to compete at, at a division three level, but I do have students who are in cross country this past year. I have a football player, I've got a men's golfer. So, you know, we have sort of in roots to some of that stuff in addition to our clubs and organizations. We, we have a very traditional college experience at Elmhurst and we hope the student wants that too. Um, someone always has to ask about the money. And so we're all pretty similarly priced except for RISE, which I think is like three times as much as we are if I remember that right, because of the, because of the iPads. I'm remembering that wrong on purpose. But we're about 47 when you round up a little bit right now, full time with housing. Um, we do have part-time, which runs more like 15 a year without housing. You can come full-time and not live on campus, which is about 37 uh, a year. And then we have access to FAFSA in the exact same way. So federal funds, uh, if you qualify, um, no loans with us through the feds. And then we do a, a scholarship at the school based on the EFC, the same information we use to determine the FAFSA. And that could be as little as 500 bucks or as much as 13,000 in a given year, depending on the family situation. Um, and then, you know, we use 529 plans and anything else you can find externally in terms of funding. Yeah, and I can answer for um, the RISE program, our costs. Uh, our institution has, um, since our onset, has seen that our program is a benefit to the Judson community, uh, so much so that they have decided to uh, discount our tuition for our students um, to a certain degree. And so our tuition is uh, $26,060 for the entire year. That's uh, tuition fees, room and board. And so that includes all fees that would um, incorporate the, uh, the education of the students. Any extracurriculars would be an extra cost to them. Uh, but we are a comprehensive transition program as well. And so students may qualify for um, the Pell Grant and the MAP Grant if they're Illinois residents um, through the free application for federal student aid. And so um, we also offer internal scholarships. We have uh, many different um, generous donors who have donated specific scholarship funds for our program specifically so that our students have an opportunity to have a college experience. And so there's many different options um, for families that may not think uh, or may not have been prepared um, to send their child off to college. As Eric was talking about, sometimes our families don't think that their students will be able to go to college. And so they may not be saving for that. And so. Um, that, that's where we land in terms of, of that. Um, and so as we kind of round off our time um, together, I'd just love uh, for each of us to go through some of the opportunities that um, our educators here can offer to their students of how they can get more information about our programs. And so um, I'm gonna send out uh, links to our websites and our contact information so you can contact us specifically um, about setting up different tours or, or giving information to families. For the RISE program, we have three preview days coming up next, next fall. Uh, we are planning on being on campus in the fall. And so um, our preview days are scheduled to be on campus and have people come and visit our campus. And so that's September 28th, November 6th, and January 5th, uh, or 15th, I'm sorry. Um, we also do personal tours for families and we do tours for school districts too. So you can contact me um, and I can schedule a tour for you. And then we also do phone calls and Zoom meetings for those who are further away um, and for uh, those who may not be comfortable with coming to the, the campus. Um, somebody asked if we'll have all students on campus in the fall. That is the, uh, the university's plan right now is to have all of our uh, traditional undergraduate students come in the fall living on campus. We're um, making the appropriate plans to make sure that we do that in a safe way. Uh, but, but we are planning on starting in August. August 25th is when our, our first day of class is. So anybody else, uh, you can tell us a little bit about uh, opportunities for students to get more information. Uh, Tim, I'll let you go first because I know you got to get going. Yeah, I got a 2.30. So we are planning to be online, or excuse me, on campus as well. Um, we're, we're definitely, you know, in phase four, which is the magic phase schools need to be in to have smaller gatherings of 50. That's going to um, complicate things for athletics and stuff. We're still sort of working all that out. Um, but we've done a lot on campus in terms of ventilation, UV lighting, and all kinds of things to make the campus a safe environment in terms of social distancing. Because we're small and we have small classes, that isn't as hard to solve. We may employ some hybrid usage. And right now, 
specific to ELSA, we're trying to make it a choice things because we adapted online fairly quickly. We used Blackboard. Um, we already had it in place before. Uh, we were using Blackboard for a number of things in the program, so it wasn't really that terribly hard to adapt using Collaborate, which is the online system Blackboard has. Um, so we have it available, and so we're allowing it to be a choice if students, because you know a lot of people in our population can be compromised, we do want to make it available. And that's same for our faculty, for that matter, too. We want to have that option available to teach online, those kinds of things. So it's going to probably have some hybrid qualities to the semester. And I think that's true for the overall college as well. If things change, you know, the state says what the state says, we're going to adhere to whatever, whatever the regulations are. Um, hopefully they won't. You know, right now, Illinois is in a pretty good shape at this point in time, but the rest of the country doesn't look so hot. So we'll see. Um, but for now, as long as we're in phase four and beyond, we're, we're going to be on campus in some way, shape, or form. And you, he's going to have my contact information and the, the uh, ELSA information is going to be in there. We are planning to do three fall online, excuse me, on campus preview days, but we'll probably have online versions like we've already done too um, to, to be accessible this way. All things are going to be both places, on campus and online this fall is how it's looking. But I have to boogie, I have another appointment, so it was a pleasure spending time with all you all. Uh, whatever they say bad about me when they leave, it's not true. Um, have a great day, everybody. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Tim. I will uh, go ahead and address some of the questions that were coming in for, for Rise as well, and then I'll let you guys kind of um, finish up with those questions too. One of them was, uh, Tim spoke about guardianship within the ELSA program. We don't have a requirement for Rise that you be your own guardian. Um, in, in those, we do uh, ask the families to dis disclose what the guardianship status of their student is. Um, just for us for safety reasons when we go to advocate for them within medical field or um, financially and different things like that. And so we do need to know that information, but it's not a requirement that our students be their own guardian there. Um, in terms of what the program might look like, um, if uh, we do need to go virtual in case of a second wave of um, COVID-19, uh, we during the first wave, we started using Google Classroom or our format. We found that a lot of our students were able to adapt to that pretty quickly. Um, and so as an institution, we have um, gotten a package for the Google Classroom and, and that's what the RISE program specifically will be using in our courses if we need to go that route. Um, right now, that's not our plan, but we do have that as a backup. Um, obviously, we need to have you know two, three, four, five different backups in this time. Um, and so, uh, that's our, our goal. Our institution uses um, eLearn. Uh, we found that that's uh, a little cumbersome for our students, and so we're utilizing the Google Classroom as, as it's a little bit more intuitive. Yep, just to add on to that, Drew. Um, right, so we're really all in a place of preparation on what's going to show up and what's going to look like. So what we've done is we've taken a look at our curriculum since we do offer a variety of different elective classes um, that can lead to different um, vocational tracks. Um, and so we pay close attention to what what are the type of electives we're going to offer, um, what uh, making sure that our all of our curriculum could be moved over virtually if something happened inside of a second wave. We were successful to quickly navigate to online, and so we've been offering virtual um, our program virtually for not only the spring but also during the summertime. So we will be virtual as well. Um, so we are really confident that we'll be able to navigate and whatever is required required to be able to continue to support our students and really offer a level of consistency at a time of such uncertainty, which has proven to be incredibly important for our students, really for all of us. Um, as for the guardianship piece, um, it is not a requirement for our students to be their own guardian. Very similar to Drew, because we are so wrapped around our students, it's incredibly important that we know um, so that we know how to navigate with whatever that shows up in those three years, when that in that three-year time period. In terms of additional options, we will continue to offer a hybrid as well. So we'll have virtual online tours available for full schools or full bodies. We will be opening up to on uh, on campus tours. However, we're going to limit them to one on one. So we'll only be one family at a time to ensure that we keep um, well under any kind of safety number. Um, we also offer a college um, summer experience program. It will be virtual. It's in August for four days, Monday 
Monday through Thursday from nine to three. And it gives an opportunity to whether it is the Pace program or Shepherds or Judson or Elsa, whatever college program that your college experience program your students are looking for, it gives them a taste of what it would look like to be a college experience student. So we do offer that as well. And of course, you'll have our contact information. So if you have any questions about or want to schedule something specifically, you'll have it to be able to reach out to me. And thank you so much for your time today. Elizabeth, can I ask you a question? Yes. For um, in the spring as well in the fall, if there's a second wave, do students go home then or do they stay in their dorms or apartments or how does that work? And if you're doing a hybrid, will they come, will they live in the dorms also or do they live at home and just do the learning part? Yep, during this, during this first wave, when it first hit, we had all of our families go, all of our students go home. We had no idea what it was gonna look like or how long it was going to last. So we had them all move out quickly and to be able to move them home as quickly as possible. Right now, in terms of what the housing will look like in this coming year, really depends on, and we haven't signed the contract yet for our housing for this upcoming year, because we want to be able to put as many caveats, Jenny, that you just pointed to, to be able to make sure that if our families, for whatever reason, have to go back home, that they're not locked into a financial commitment that they're not going to be using. So we want to be sure that we are as fiscally responsible, that if it ends up being hybrid but it's from home or they're at their dorms that we have as much flexibility in that lease as possible but it's definitely options we're looking for all right real quick i know we're on our time here but shepherds is opening this fall august 15th it would take me a long time to go through how we're opening the short story is we're going to do phased openings so we have we're going to have somewhere around 90 ish students next year um, we're anticipating. And so we bring in cohorts of about 36. And so year one is going to come on August 15th and about a week and a half later cohorts um, years two and three will be coming in as well. We have a lot of different practices in place for social distancing and safety. If you go to our website, um, shepherdscollege.edu, there's a bar on the top that says COVID-19. If you click that, it will give you the whole list of how we are opening our program next year. Um, we finished this year with e-learning through the use of Google Classroom and Zoom and um, Flipgrid and a bunch of other stuff that our educators know way more about than I do. Um, and then this semester, our students are gonna go home in thank, uh, right after Thanksgiving and finish with three weeks of e-learning into Christmas and then have another phased opening coming back in January, similar to what we're doing um, in August. As far as admissions opportunities, we had two virtual preview days for the first time this summer. Uh, we anticipate to have more. We don't have the dates released yet, but as you have, um, or any educators also, but even parents and families, um, we can do personal virtual preview days together through our online platform through the use of Zoom. Uh, we can do on-campus on tours um, fairly soon here, so with social distancing as well. And I can have more details on that as families and educators reach out and they would like. So there you go. Great, thank you. And so I just wanted to thank you all of you for uh, attending our educator fair today. Uh, I hope that the information was very helpful to you. Um, I hope that uh, if you have any questions that you'll reach out to us individually. Like I said, I will follow up with an email um, that has all of our contact information and um, our, our links to our websites and things like that. And so uh, I thank you so much for attending. And if you have any further questions, like I said, reach out to us. We are more than happy to um, answer any questions that you may have about our program specifically. We hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye.